We must all of us learn to trust. Our fellow men, perhaps, sir, but not all the women. That new parlourmaid, for instance, I wouldn't trust her as far as a flick of her feather duster. You made a joke, Hudson. Uh, well, it was a, a wee attempted one, sir. I'm sorry. Not at all. We were all of us in this country in awe with upstairs, downstairs, and Gordon was the, the father of the, of the series. He called himself a jobbing actor, but he was the nicest jobbing actor I have ever met. He seemed to have been in every film that was ever made since 1944. The Great Escape. It Chris. Mutiny on the Bounty. With Gordon, like with all really great actors, they make everybody that they work with better. Why can't you say you are my lover? I do not want to be your lover. I want to be your husband. He had this ability to bring the audience in and to make the audience like him. I'm not quite sure whether they're upstairs or downstairs. <laughs> he was outrageous with the gossip. My father's best qualities were his tolerance, his generosity, and his kindness. I've told you my terms, and if you don't like them, you can go to, you can go to Glasgow. He was a big star, but he didn't ever see himself as a big star. Gordon Jackson was born in 1923 in Glasgow, the youngest of six children. They lived in a, a one-floor apartment above a newsagent or a, a, on a shop on the Byers Road. Not a big house, very small. I can't imagine he even had his own bedroom. He, he was from a, a Scottish Calvinist family, you know, which quite a strict but a very loving upbringing. He was the youngest. He had loads of nephews and nieces, so it was a huge, huge family. And family life was, as a child and also as a father, very, very important to him. Young Gordon's talents were spotted whilst he was still at school. Dad was helped into the, the world of entertainment by the English teacher at uh, the school, who knew someone at the BBC. He actually started as a pianist. And he was on a programme called Auntie Kathleen's Half Hour, I think it was, which is the Scottish equivalent of Children's Hour, a radio programme, and playing the piano. And then gradually they got him reading poems and things like that. Gordon Jackson left school at 15 and took an apprenticeship as a draftsman at the Rolls-Royce shipyards. But within a couple of years, thanks to the early exposure on radio, he was chosen by Ealing Film Studios to star in a wartime propaganda film. During the war in Glasgow, my mother had a cataclysmic shock. It wasn't the Blitz in Glasgow, that hadn't happened yet, but she'd read in the paper that a young Hillhead High School boy, that was my school, had got into movies. And I thought that's rather nice for him, but my mother, not pleased at all. She said, that should have been you. He's after us, all right, he's coming back again. Wait for it. I think Jock stopped one. I think that there was a need in Scotland to show that the Scots people were solidly behind the war. And Dad happened to be the boy that was chosen for this propaganda uh, come entertainment. He died a lot. He did die. He, de he died a lot of deaths. It's no use, Anne. This is what I get on. And he thought it was just a one-off. So he went back to Rolls-Royce, and then came another call, and he thought, I like this, I do like this. Finding himself in demand as an actor, Gordon quit his apprenticeship to star in a succession of movies, including a rare leading role in the 1949 romance Flood Tide, starring young Scottish actress Rona Anderson. He played a shipyard worker. Mum played the daughter of the shipyard owner. It was extraordinary. It mirrored their real life. Oh, David, I really came here to beg your pardon for being such a pig to you. And to tell you that I love you very much. On-screen courtship quickly developed into real-life romance, and Gordon married Rona in 1951. After Flood Tide came a key role in the hit healing comedy, Whiskey Galore. It's interesting, watching Whiskey Galore again, 
um, I was struck by how, how advanced Gordon's acting was compared to many of those around him. He was actually very modern, way back then. It was very real. I asked Katrina to marry me. What did she say? She said yes. He, he didn't do acting. A lot of people were doing acting around about him, but he, he just talked. Although Gordon had become a film star in his early 20s, he had a thoroughly practical approach to his profession. I think his, his modesty was completely genuine. When he, when he said he was a jobbing actor, he meant it. And it was the truth. All the uh, fripperies of stardom were not for him. He liked to do the job, did it well, no tantrums, no temperament, just quietly got on with it. But how can you be a, a committed, a deeply committed professional actor, which clearly you are? Oh, I'm not. <laughs> You're not. I, no, no. You want to I, go out and come I, in again? But no. <laughs> I do it as a, a job of work. I'm not deeply committed. Gordon's level headed attitude to acting meant that throughout the 1950s he was rarely out of work, playing solid supporting roles in over 40 films in 10 years. He took almost every job that was offered because he, he thought that if he said no, then some power somewhere in the universe would say, oh. In that case, we won't offer you any more. How many films have you made? I know it goes into an awful lot of them. Oh, I have no idea. I mean, it's well over 50, it's 70 or something. I believe so, I don't know. I mean, I pop <laughs> in and out of a lot of films. I mean, I was in New York not long ago, and there was a late night movie on, and I said to my wife, this is the worst film I've ever seen, and suddenly a door opened and I walked in. I didn't even know I was in it. <laughs> Happily married for eight years, in 1959, the Jacksons became parents to first child Graham, and Gordon's growing reputation as a top-class supporting actor opened the door to Hollywood. You're crazy. You want to be locked up. You too. He would say, oh, I was in a film once, and you'd think, yeah, he was talking about Mutiny on the Bounty. He just, he worked with so many huge people. You know, working with Marlon Brando, I mean, that's like working with God. I was on that for 13 months. I had two birthdays on that. I mainly enjoyed it, watching Marlon Brando working. He can't remember lines, he says, mm. and he has them stuck all over the place. And so when you see Marlon Brando going, ah, uh, you know he does that thing <laughs> looking up like that. He's looking, what's my next line? And it's up uh. there. But rubbing shoulders with Hollywood legends had its downside and meant that Gordon wasn't present for the birth of his second child, Roddy, in 1961. He missed the first eight months of Roddy's life. In those days, you couldn't, you know, scoot back from Tahiti to see your wife give birth and then go back again. So um, he was so sad about this. Today, people take maternity leave and it's inconceivable that you wouldn't see your child for nine months. But when we were young, we didn't really know that our dad was an actor. If he was in a film, he was away for a bit and that was it. Back in Britain, Gordon put family first, only taking work close to home including starring in the classic 1965 thriller, The Ipcress File. Harry. Ipcress? Have you got your car outside? Yes. I'm going to see Radcliffe. I want to try a wee experiment. Now in his late 40s, Gordon was keen to prove himself on stage and was proud to take the role of Horatio in Tony Richardson's 1969 production of Hamlet at the Roundhouse Theatre in London. Horatio, or I do forget myself. I say, my lord, and your poor servant of the her, my... Hamlet was played by the temperamental Nicole Williamson, who on one occasion panicked Gordon by halting the performance and starting to take off his costume. Yes, Nicole Williamson had this kind of, uh, I don't know what it was, slight nervous breakdown on stage. When, when Nicholson stopped and, and said, oh, this is terrible, now I ask for your money back, I'm not going to have that. He started to take his costume off. And Gordon thought he'd better start ad-libbing. When he said, oh, my, my, my liege, you've, uh, you've uh, dropped your cloak. <laughs> let, let me retrieve it for you. Oh, pretty, my lord, don't get yourself in such a state. <laughs> After Hamlet, Gordon cemented his reputation by starring in The Prime of Miss Jean Brodie opposite Maggie Smith, who won an Oscar for her performance. Oh, I don't understand you, Jean. You will not marry me, and yet you feed me and share my bed. Share your bed? Why can't you say you are my lover? I do not want to be your lover. I want to be your husband. He'd made his name in films, but it was the role of an Edwardian butler in a phenomenally successful television drama that was about to turn Gordon Jackson into one of the country's most popular actors. 
By the early 1970s, Gordon Jackson and his family had adopted Hampstead in North London as their home, with Gordon rarely returning to his native Scotland. A veteran of over 60 films, Gordon still wasn't a household name, but taking the central role in a new television costume drama was about to introduce him to a much wider audience. The premise was that you took a London house, um, you know, five or six floors, and you took the front away, and you saw what was happening on each floor. So you have upstairs and downstairs. I am the house parlourmaid. The butler has to be somebody who has authority, but also without being sort of demeaning, um, has to know how to deal with upstairs in that sense. Gordon Jackson was perfect because he had huge dignity and authority, but he knew how to defer to Lady Marjorie. Oh, yes, Hudson. I intend to engage this young woman. She'll have her dinner in the servants' hall and collect her belongings afterwards. Rose can show her what to do. And the young person's name, my lady? Sarah. The public was waiting for this story. It... It was a costume drama, but not like the classic serials of the BBC. It was a costume drama with an ongoing story, with characters that everybody instantly fell in love with. And, and the main thing was the dynamic between upstairs and downstairs. He was completely the linchpin of the, of the series because he was the coordinating element, being the butler between upstairs and down. As they said, action, you'd see him kind of morphing into Hudson. His head would be held differently, his configuration of his, as I say, something slightly unpleasant was on. The wonderful thing about Hudson was, first of all, that he had everything that Gordon brought to any part, um, which was a tremendous warmth, honesty, and also, uh, of course, what he overlaid on Hudson, uh, an honourable strictness. You know, he was, he really, he ran a tight ship. Rose, you are to instruct Sarah in her duties. Yes, Mr. Hudson. With a good heart and a glad will, if you please, Rose. Naturally, Mr. Hudson. He brought an old-fashioned Edwardian, straight-laced discipline. He knew that character and that man so perfectly. Feet off the table in this house, if you don't mind, Mr. Watkins. Put that thing out. The central heart of it was indeed Gordon's heart. And so, in every way, Gordon was the father of the series. What? Hello, Hudson. It's nice to see you again. Yes, yes, indeed, my lord. And you too. But the responsibility of being the cornerstone of the series was a heavy burden for such a consummate professional. He worried about it <laughs> so much. He was so concerned about being inside the man he was playing. He got very nervous. He used to make me feel guilty because I'm a bit of a kind of a, a winger in a way. Gordon always made me feel that I wasn't working hard enough and that I ought to go and look at my script better. His scripts were completely filled with um, little with inflections and hieroglyphics and things. And I'd look on mine and I would have drawn uh, an indifferent angel and maybe two words and that was it. Upstairs Downstairs ran for five years and its huge success made it a popular target for parody. Everybody was watching it. Yes, and everybody knew the characters so well. Uh, you rang, my lady. At last! <laughs> Hudson! Hudson, I specifically asked Mrs. Bridges for fairy cakes, and what <laughs> have you brought? <laughs> this is Rock Hudson. A major role in the most popular drama series on television ensured that Gordon Jackson was now firmly in the mainstream. Could you please tell me where King Charles II of England and Peterborough is holding his licentious revels? I'm not quite sure whether they're upstairs or downstairs. <laughs> the ITV personality for 1975 is that gentleman's gentleman, Gordon Jackson. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen for this beautiful award for my performance in the Morecambe and Wise Christmas show. <laughs> and in 1979, Gordon received royal recognition when he was awarded the OBE for services to entertainment. 
Isn't it beautiful? Very thrilled. <laughs> we all love dealing with the whole circus of the in the in the success of upstairs downstairs. A lot of us did, but I don't think. Gordon truly did. He knew it went with the job and he had to do it and he was very gracious about it. But he would always be looking to see if, it was, if he could go now. Away from the cameras, Gordon shunned publicity, preferring to live a quiet life, only socialising with a small and protective group of friends and fellow actors. We moved to Hampstead as well. The Contis, the Jacksons and the Aldertons and we've been here a long time together. It was always a very warm house. You know, the, the atmosphere in it was pleasant, happy, and you, you always looked forward to going to the Jacksons. He hardly ever went out. He, he liked the entertainment to be at home. A lot to do with music and talking. Kenneth Williams, you know, was a huge friend of his, and you'd think light years apart. And they had a real friendship and appreciation of each other. His sense of humour was quite, could be quite villainous and quite sharp and I can't tell you any of the stories that he told us because we'd be put off the air but <laughs> it was surprising. He was outrageous with the gossip. He liked nothing better than getting around a different group of people together, getting around the piano, singing songs. There was one song that Kenneth Williams did. They made it up the night before the show and Gordon simply couldn't believe Kenneth was confident enough to make something up one night and then go on television live the next day. Gordon Jackson, great, I always, I always say great, one of the great musicologists, suggested this charming musical setting. On a soir qui mal y pense, fait toujours reconnaissance, Anna Smith Palais des Danses. <laughs> It was a joy having Kenneth come over. I mean, he adored children, and uh, bedtime stories from Kenneth were fantastic. We had the time of our lives. Two years after Upstairs Downstairs ended, Gordon took the role of George Cowley, head of fictional law enforcement department CI5 in the action drama The Professionals. The show was an instant success and made stars out of its two young leads, Lewis Collins and Martin Shaw. Well, he was he was our boss. You know, he was the the, the tough man who was directing this special CI5 unit. And uh, he used to laugh at himself because he never considered himself tough in any way at all, and he used to say, I don't know why I'm playing this part. I think he had doubts early on about whether he was right for the part. He expressed it to one or two actor friends. Body! Dial! But it was an opportunity to bury Hudson, because otherwise I think it had been typecast. Something that might interest us. And it must be death or disaster. It certainly does. And as it's tied into an arms robbery, it could be disaster. We used to love shooting the guns, you know, that would be great for us and to put on these silly tough faces. And Gordon would get hold of the gun. If ever he had to shoot it, he'd go... <laughs> we said, no, Gordon, you mustn't shut your eyes. He says, oh, God, did I do that again? Uh, he, was, he was just lovely, just the sweetest man. And whatever material he was working with, Gordon remained as meticulous an actor as ever. Every line was highlighted in the script, even to the extent that I once saw him learn a misprint. It was something like, uh, and you, Doyle, will be standing by at, the, by at the corner here, and Buddy will intercept in his can. And the director said, cut, Gordon, what's a can? He says, I was wondering about that. <laughs> While the success of The Professionals only served to increase Gordon Jackson's popularity, there was trouble at home when son Roddy's drug addiction hit the headlines in 1984, an addiction he managed to overcome. He, he was always supportive. Um, there was never a moment where I felt, I can't go home, I can't say what happened. There were times when people might think that perhaps I shouldn't have gone home, but uh, we were a very strong family. 
Towards the end of the 80s, Gordon made only infrequent appearances in films and on television, and in December 1989, he contacted Roddy with some devastating news. Dad said, uh, oh, hello, Roddy. Oh, I think it's the big C. And it hit you like a slam, it's like a slam in your face. It was so late, the, the diagnosis, but you know, in his stoic way, he, he just accepted it. That was that, there was nothing to be done. And I was going away. I was doing a promotional tour of a film. And Gordon came along in the car and he gave me a great big hug. And he said, see you when you get back. And then I waved to him and there was this shining, shining face smiling at me and waving. And off he went and off I went. And I never saw him again because he was dead within weeks. After a short illness, Gordon Jackson died of cancer on January the 15th, 1990, aged 66. Rona asked me to read at his memorial service and there were no speeches or anything. She didn't want any of that, but she gave me his Bible and, and I opened it and there were the markings. There were the markings as the way he'd read it. And I said to everybody, listen, this is going to be difficult for me to get through this. Oh, thank you, Rose. The nice part of Gordon um, always came across on, on the screen. You know, the, the, the decency of him. It was for you as well as for me. You've just got this, you know, this sincerity and, and warmth and generosity of spirit. Goodbye. The one thing that was important was that we were happy. And he was always supportive. And I'm very grateful that he was. He was marvellous. Well, we all know that long-lost family certainly knows how to touch our hearts, and tomorrow night is no exception as the current series comes to an end. Davina and Nikki are here with that at nine. A world Lewis is not particularly familiar with is where he's led into for the sake of an investigation. That's next this evening.